Maps can certainly help us navigate from A to B. As a family firm, you may be interested to know that a map has been designed especially for you. Morton Benenson, the Andre and Rosalie Hoffman Chair Professor of Family Enterprise, has written a book with that exact same title, The Family Business Map, and is here with us um, to tell us more about it. Welcome to INSEAD Knowledge, Morton. Thank you. So, what is the biggest challenge for family firms today? The biggest challenge in one sentence is to design long-term solutions to be a sustainable family business. Now remember that family firms have many more challenges than normal business. It's a very complex system. You know, they have all the challenges that the typical business, non-family business have, but then on top of that, it has a family and issues, challenges like, you know, family development, growing families, career path, conflict, becomes central challenges for family businesses. On the second level, we have challenges from industries, from markets, which hits family businesses beyond what it hits normal businesses, in particular because family businesses don't want to give up control. So sustainable business development when market concentrates can be a huge challenge for family firms. And then on the third level, we have challenges from institutions which hit family businesses. So these can be issues like taxes, inheritance laws, but also um, issues like one-child policies in China becomes a big challenge for Chinese family businesses. So I would say there are many, many challenges today that family businesses faces. However, the, the fundamental challenge is to design long-term solutions to these challenges. Okay, so um, are there regional differences um, globally that family firms face, and do you think um, they can learn from each other? Yes. <laughs> the short answer, yes. So, first of all, there are many similarities between family firms across the world. What we say in the book is that the three levels of challenges, having a family, the issues re related to family, the issues related to market development, the issues related to institutions, cultures, taxes, these things, they are shared by all families across the world. Now, the actual painting of these challenges can be very, very different. So, for instance, uh, family culture is very different in Asia than it is in the US or in the Europe. Issues like um, time and space may differ. So, many European family businesses today are two, three, sometimes 400 years old and have grown very, very large. So one of the, whereas, you know, if you go to India, if you go to China in particular, you have family business. Most family businesses are only 20, 30, maybe 50, maybe sometimes 100 years old. So I think, you know, this time and space difference provide a, a interesting, you know, sphere where families can learn from each other across continents. So I think, Asian family businesses can learn a lot from European family businesses. I also think that European or Western or uh, American family businesses can learn from Asian family businesses. But let's talk about the assets and the roadblocks that are mentioned in your book. You, you've developed a tool designed to help um, families to uh, leverage their assets and reduce their roadblocks. Can you explain how that works in practice? The family business map it's a very practical tool that helps family businesses to design long-term solutions to the challenges they have. Now, it has three steps. The first step is a very practical step, which is about you know, finding out what is the strategic advantages that families have, what is it actually that families deliver to their business, and how does that help the business now, and how can we use it in the best possible way in the future. That's the strategic side. Then there's the, what we could call the challenge side, the roadblock side, and that is to identify what are the particular roadblocks that this family faces for developing the business in the future. And we already talked about these can be on the family side, these can be on the market side, or the institutional side. That's the first step of the family business map, that is to identify the strategic advantages, 
and the challenges that a family business face. And how does that happen exactly? So that step, we, we have developed a, a very practical questionnaire survey approach where we can either, you know, together with families, interview them about these questions, or we have also done it for up to 5,000 firms are we doing it now in Scandinavia, uh, where we provide them with a number of questions which are designed so they help finding out and focusing on the big challenges and on the strategic assets. The second step in the family business map is to map <laughs> these assets and roadblocks. So the idea here is to think, you know, what are the implications of having very strong strategic family assets, for instance, or big challenges on the family side, or big challenges on institutional or market side? Which implication does that have for the future management and ownership of the firm? So the mapping step is really to say, given the identification we did in step one on strategic advantages, the family assets, on the governance challenges, the roadblocks, what is the natural path for the next 20, 30 years of this family business? The third step is then to cultivate the mapping that has been done. Because, of course, when we do a family succession, there's a lot of challenges that raises and a lot of things that the family should focus on to make the best possible family succession in the next 20 years. Or if we figure out that maybe we want to exit in 10, 20 years. There's a lot of issues that ha are related to that, you know, making the firm uh, transparent, designing governance mechanisms. So the cultivate step is really a step about, you know, given the overall path we choose, what are the relevant questions to work with for the family and the business the next 10, 20 years. So in short, the map is really a three-step process. And the first step is to map sorry, to identify the strength and the weakness challenges of the firm. The second step is to map the natural way forward. And the third step is to cultivate this map so we end up in the best possible solution for the family and for the business. Well, fam families often choose to go public. What, what are the issues that they need to consider in that instance? That is a very interesting question. And this is actually one of the drivers for writing this book because both Joseph Fan, my co-author, and myself noticed that there's certain patterns which are very, very popular. Going public is one of them. Entrusting ownership, making family trust is another thing. And the more we learned about it, the more we realized that families have a very simple perspective, or used to have a very simple perspective of of changing really dramatic governance issues like the ownership structure. So for instance, historically, most family businesses went public for two reasons. One was to get capital to expand the firm. Going public is a very efficient way to do that. We sell some shares, we get capital in, and we can expand. That's a finance way. The second solution was to allow individual family members to exit. So this was a challenge in many family businesses that the family has grown. There's becoming diverting interest from the family in the firm. Some family members do want to cash out and have a higher consumption level. Unfortunately, many family firms after going public have discovered that life is not that simple, that going public can be a, a very, very good solution for some family businesses, but it certainly also are cases where it has been very challenging. Even to the extent that families have lost their firm. You know, one very famous example of this is the Cadbury chocolate family uh, who went public in, in the early 60s. And then after that grew the company to be the biggest confectionery company in the world. But 40 years later, it turned out that they were actually very vulnerable to uh, uh, aggressive raider <laughs> that wanted to buy uh, the whole company and delist it. And in 2010, it was uh, sold to Kraft. And this was very much against the family's uh, will. So what are we learning from studying how it goes with family businesses that go public? First of all, families need to understand 
being a public firm is different from being a private firm. They, there are governance issues. You cannot run your family business at the Sunday table. Suddenly there are minority investors which have rights, information rights. You cannot give, you know, typically you cannot give more information to the family members than to the other investors. They can be vocal, even if the family controls 70% of, of the shares. You know, they can still go to the newspapers, they can still be very vocal if they're dissatisfied. And ultimately, there can be a hostile takeover or an uninvited takeover, even in situations where family feels very secure. Yeah, you talk about conflict there. What are the potential conflicts by bringing in external management, for example? Now, it's a situation where the family still has strong ownership of the family business, but typically the family realized that maybe after the first generation, there's not a lot of strategic contribution from the family anymore. Maybe, maybe the founder has left, maybe um, the company has developed in a way that these unique family assets, it could be the founder's network, could be the founder's um, history, it could be the founder's um, values, does not mean that much for the development of the company. In that situation, we would say, you know, why don't we start to think about using external management? Now, in that situation, it's extremely important to cultivate what we call good corporate governance practices. So the worst thing for an external manager that are hired in a family business is that he is overrun by the family, that he is not able to make his own space, that all the employees look at him as you know, some kind of puppet for the family. And whenever there's a real question, you know, the empl employees would go around the external manager and ask the family members. That's a situation which is extremely important to avoid. So, for the family, I think the most critical part of, of working with external management is to be a responsible owner. That is to understand where the role of the family is, to give the external managers leverage and stay in the board and only kind of be involved in the bigger decision, the strategic development of the firm. But it's really important that the external managers have the 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 freedom and the space to develop the day-to-day -day management. Second, from the external managers, I believe that going into a family business, it's very, very important to share the fundamental values, the fundamental vision that the family has. Now, sometimes we see cases where the family man managers, or oh, sorry, the external managers come into family businesses where they don't really respect the history of the firm. They don't really respect what the family has developed. They focus very much on about all the failures the family have done, and they think they can take this company to a completely different place. Now, that may be true, but it's, it's a receipt for disaster because this kind of external managers do not share the fundamental values, do not share the fundamental history and respect for what has been done in the family business before they entered the firm. So I think these are the two crucial things for the family to be a responsible owner that understand that the external managers are hired because he or she is good and they have to give them space to develop their abilities. For the external managers, it's very much about sharing the values of the families to to be able to develop this in a, in a fruitful relationship with the family. Okay, Morten, and what would you say are the key takeaways from your book? The key takeaway from this book is that families have to find sustainable solutions to their long-term challenges. Now, the book provides a receipt for doing that through three steps. Step one is identifying the strategic advantages, the family assets, the unique contributions from the family to the firm, and identifying the challenges on the family level, on the market level, on the institutional level that the family and the firm faces. Step two is from this identification to map 
a path for the next 20 years, an overall path on where to go with the ownership, where to go with the management structure. And then finally on step three, really to design the cultivation of this path, to raise and answer the number of relevant questions along the path that is chosen. I think that's the key takeaway of the family business map. Morten Bannison, thank you very much for joining us on INSEAD Knowledge. Thank you.